those of you who've been around a couple of years, in 2012, there was a focus group and congregational survey. We did that before we did the move and we brought in the new minister. And I took a look at the results of our spiritual religious orientations. Number one, that everybody chose, or about 150, 200 respondents, was ethical religion. But if you combine the things that, com that create the atheist, humanist, agnostic group, it is by far the largest answer of uh, spiritual religious orientation. For example, humanism got 58 responses, agnosticism 39, skepticism 28, atheism 27 for about 152 or about half of the respondents. So we've got an atheist humanist group, meetings are once a month, there are 30 some people who are members of the group and I would like to first of all introduce Jan Robin who's going to talk to her about how her atheist perspective has helped her through some of the troubles in life, followed next by Bertie Reed, then Dave Carlson, and Betty Hogan. I am a confident atheist. I wasn't always confident, and I wasn't always an atheist. I was raised in a loosely Christian home. We went to church not every Sunday, but always on Easter. <laughs> As a teenager, I went to church with friends. First the Baptist church, then the Methodist church, and finally the Presbyterian church. It wasn't faith that took me to church. It was social contact. I thought I was a Christian. I was told by grandma I should read the Bible. But reading the Bible was difficult. I'm slightly dyslexic. And um, it was downright baffling. I tried, but none of it made sense. When my father died at age 43 of a heart attack, I was only 20 years old and I was eight months pregnant with my first child. Daddy wanted a daughter, a granddaughter. I had three sons. <laughs> he was very active in this community, Costa Mesa, and was loved by many. There were 800 people at his funeral. Unfortunately, the funeral service was not at all comforting to me. I felt let down. I was devastated. My world <coughs> had been torn apart. I still thought I was a Christian, but at every turn in my life, I was questioning and uncomfortable with religion. Not until um, 18 years later, when I married Joe Roven, my fourth husband, <laughs> did I hear any atheist logic. Finally, something made sense. <laughs> Joe is a genius and an engineer. He guided me, asked me questions, gave me ideas to think about, like how science works, letting me make up my own mind. He never told me, this is what you have to believe, or there weren't any ors. Here is what I believe now as an atheist. I believe in the UU principles. I'm so glad I came here. I believe in science and the scientific process. And when 
at this time in our history, science doesn't have the answers. I cannot believe in supernatural answers. I don't believe in ghosts, spirits, gods, devils, heaven or hell, ground up rhino horn being an aphrodisiac, <laughs> the number 13 being bad luck, or any other superstition. I believe the answers that we don't have now from science, just as in our past history, science will have many of those answers in the future. Did you know that the world is round and it revolves around the sun? I believe whether it was a Big Bang or some other occurrence that started the creation of all that we see and don't see, those things were not created by a supernatural being. That's just too simplistic for me. I don't fear not knowing yet. The answers will come just like penicillin and finding a way to put a man on the moon and many other scientific discoveries. As most of you know, I lost one of my three sons seven years ago. Eric Recock Fogel was only 41 and he dies from a heart attack. If I thought losing my father was devastating, this could have been so much worse. But at this time, this sudden tragic death in my immediate family affected me differently. I can't agree with anyone who tells me Eric is in a better place. The better place would be right here <laughs> with his family and friends. I don't believe that any part of him went anywhere except into our memories. This is a finality that is comforting to me. It's kind of like solving a problem or finishing a book or completing a project. I now get on with the rest of my life. I can enjoy the memories of Eric and attend to my grandson, his son. I can't possibly wallow in self-pity because I lost my son. Rather, I can revel in the memory that Eric was a great big 6'3", 320, uh, very clever, very <coughs> funny, good guy. He was a loving father, husband, son, brother, and friend. One more thing. My most favorite memory is that he happened to be a donor. You know, the pink dot on your license, your driver's license. Eric helped 64 people with skin, bones, tissues, and corneas. This is what I turn to when I feel sad. Being an atheist gives me a clear picture. It helps me concentrate on the positive memories and accept the world and my life on face value. What I see what I got 
makes me happy. Thank you. As a young child, I realized that the God story was one my mind rejected. Sensing that this was not to be shared, I kept my skepticism to myself. As time went on, my mind entertained various options, but none fit. I attended Sunday school and participated in youth <coughs> groups, but refused to be confirmed. In college, I chose to sleep in on Sunday. As a philosophy major, I also took some religion courses and there encountered Unitarianism. This was before merger. I had already become half of a couple, a relationship that resulted in a long marriage. Part of our attraction was our mutual skepticism regarding the God story. For me, the question remained, but in fact, I was and am an intellectual agnostic and a functioning atheist. Why do I go to church, even when I question the word church, preferring the word congregation? One, the intellectual stimulus a thoughtful sermon can provide. The rituals, forms that surround the sermon is something my late husband, Charlie, endured, and that I tolerate, although I admit to enjoying the chalice lighting, and the time of all ages when it illustrates the theme. The music enhances the experience. Two, a company of like-minded people who come together, agreeing to follow their individual paths, respecting the differences to form a community. Joys and sorrows help build that community, and although I find the candle lighting a little strange, I respect that others find value in it. That community is there to help in times of illness and of sorrow, and to rejoice in times of joy. Three, the opportunity to set, share social justice, work as a faith community, valuing reason and human potential to make society better for all. Four, <clears throat> I have developed a deep love for our faith tradition and its purposes and principles. I find the principles challenging as I sometimes struggle with the first. In times of horror, it can be difficult to find worth and dignity in the perpetrators of acts of terror. I persevere and find strength and affirmation in it and all the following principles. I feel pride in our many way stands adopted over the decades at General Assembly. Our early affirmation of LGBT rights, anti-racism work, the evolution of standing on the side of love from embracing LGBT families to embracing immigrant families. There are many others. I feel fortunate to have participated in this work both at regional and national levels. You use it affirm the separation of church and state, thus protecting the democratic process. Some humanist atheists see going to church as a shield, protecting them from those who at best assume Christianity for all, and at worst would impose it on all. Although that is not a motivating force for me, I have to admit that referring to my congregation can help avoid unwanted conversations that do not admit dialogue. There are so, these are some of the reasons that this humanist atheist affirms this congregation and is proud to be part of the larger UU community. <clears throat> Good morning, I'm Dave Carlson. Pleased to join this group this morning. <clears throat> And to say once again how happy and proud I am to be a Unitarian Universalist. <coughs> As I prepared for today, I realized that I uh, have had perfect attendance, near perfect attendance, despite being an atheist for nearly 40 years. <coughs> um, <coughs> I think for two primary reasons. First, I'm not dead yet. <laughs> uh, and second, I haven't finished evolving. Another way of saying that this is I still have time to get better and to become more enlightened. I come to church because I'm very serious about this process of evolution. 
A few years ago, a minister in Michigan um, said his introduction to a sermon, his role was to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. <laughs> he then afflicted me <clears throat> with this sermon, tolerance is not enough. I grew up in the 60s on one of the very active campuses, uh, the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, and tolerance was a huge and demanding objective of uh, people at that time. We learned that we needed to be tolerant of the poor, the black, and even the welfare mothers. Until that moment of affliction, I was pretty self-satisfied that I had evolved to an incredible level of tolerance. So what was this guy saying that tolerance wasn't enough? He pointed out that tolerance is certainly better than non-tolerance, but as we evolve, we needed to view tolerance as just one step in the evolutionary process. And in fact, the phrase he used was not tolerating the differences, but embracing the differences. <coughs> a light went off, I had a new insight, and a new lifelong challenge of embracing differences, not just tolerating them. Finally, in a series of sermons uh, a couple of years later, he, uh, that he called Wounded Words, uh, he f pointed out that we had lost the value of many of the early Christian words because we had abandoned them, not continued to explore them. <clears throat> words like forgiveness, sin, redemption, and grace. I plan to do a sermon on grace at some point because I believe in that word there are some possible insights that we can use in our own evolutions. So even as an atheist, I come to church nearly every Sunday, as my wife would uh, testify to. Um, <clears throat> because it inspires me to lift the expectation, expectations, to lift the expectations of myself. Hopefully the result is I go back into the world with more empath empathy, more understanding, a more loving attitude, with more compassion than I had when I walked in. I look forward so much to uh, continuing this journey with you and this congregation. Thank you. Good morning. <clears throat> I'm Betty Hogan, a longtime member of this church. One reason an atheist, humanist, or agnostic would go to church, especially this church, is to become knowledgeable about the different faiths that are in our culture. Our church is a very good place to learn about these without the biases that one might get elsewhere. Why should we know about beliefs that we don't agree with? First, these beliefs, these, uh, sorry, uh, the important stories and teachings of the major religions, especially Jewish and Christian, are common in our culture, especially in uh, art, music, literature, poetry, and even in politics. A lot can be missed if one does not know them. Second, it's important to understand the views of the people with whom we will interact every day and to keep from making fools of ourselves or offending others. For example, I advise against saying, Merry Christmas or Happy Birthday to a Jehovah's Witness. Or saying, you only live once, live it up. 
to one who believes in reincarnation. Uh, um, in fact, with very little effort, one can make a fool of oneself and a fan at the same time. <laughs> Children, as well as adults, should learn these teachings and stories. This is why I spend a lot of time in the religious education uh, department teaching the children in the classes. One of my favorite things to do is to study a faith for five or six weeks with junior <coughs> and senior high school students and then take them to visit the place of worship of that faith. Of course, I make sure ahead of time that we will be welcome and that it looks like it would be a good experience for us all. I do not consider myself to be an atheist. I am definitely a humanist and a skeptic. I'm comfortable with the word agnostic, which to me means I don't know enough to decide. <coughs> One thing I am very sure of is that the faith in which I was raised is not correct. I cannot accept that there is a heaven populated only by the occupants of one church. And that a fairly small church considering all the people who've ever lived. <laughs> Nor can I accept that the rest will all burn in hell for eternity because they couldn't accept the teachings of this one church, or they've never heard them. And this at the hands of a loving creator God. <laughs> In addition to taking classes on religion that are given at this church, I recommend the book Religious Literacy by Stephen Pearl He states, religious illiteracy is dangerous. Religion has been one of the greatest forces for good in the world and one of the greatest forces for evil. Chapter six is a dictionary of religious literacy, which lists the minimum that one should know about each of the major faiths. Even Unitarianism gets a paragraph. <laughs> and the UU merger is mentioned. As to what to expect after this slide, I guess I'll find out when I get there. <laughs> or not, as the case may be. <laughs> what matters to me is that I leave this world a little better place for my having been here. And next we are going to sing a song that I suggested for this service called Amazing Place. It's my favorite religious song to the tune of my least favorite <laughs> religious song, Amazing Grace. I dislike songs which are demeaning. This contradicts our first principle, the worth and dignity of every person. I'm not a wretch. <laughs> I've never been a wretch. <laughs> and I don't intend on becoming one. <laughs> and changing the word to soul doesn't make it okay for me. <laughs> so today, you get the atheist, humanist, skeptic, agnostic version. And in the second verse, there is a word that may not be in your vocabulary, eupraxophy, that means altruism. 